you have your Bibles, you can turn to Philippians chapter 2, uh, back in our study in Philippians, Philippians 2, 25 through 30, uh, will be our text for this morning. Uh, probably every one of you, every student at least, uh, at one point or another, learned something about Isaac Newton. Uh, he was not the inventor of big Newtons, as far as I know, but uh, he was a 17th century inventor, philosopher, physicist, mathematician, and uh, so much more. He's considered to be one of the most influential scientists of all time. Well, fewer people have heard of, probably some of you have, but fewer people have heard of Edmund Haley, who was a friend and contemporary of Newton. But you could really say that if it wasn't for Haley, the world may never have learned so much about Isaac Newton. It was Edmund Haley who challenged Newton to think through some of his original ideas. It was Haley who corrected Newton's mathematical errors. And it was Haley who convinced his timid friend, Newton, uh, to publish his work on natural philosophy. It was Haley who edited and supervised and even uh, funded the publication of that work. And the only reason that we're even, uh, any of us even know about Haley is because of the comet that he discovered uh, in Charter that would be named after him, Haley's Comet. Of course, is seen briefly once every 76 years, and then disappears into the galaxy again, which is much like Haley himself. Historians call this relationship that the two had one of the most selfless examples in the world of science. Newton would receive the prominence and the, the recognition, and Haley would receive little credit or attention from his peers. Uh, one biographical statement about Haley quoted him as saying that he didn't care who received the credit. His mission in life was simply to advance the cause of science. Now, Edmund Haley is a lot like the man that we're going to look at this morning, a man whose mission in life was to advance the cause of Christ, regardless of whether or not he ever received any credit for it. Today we look at a man uh, named Epaphroditus. Now, not much is known about uh, this man, only what we see in the book of Philippians. He was not an apostle. He was not well known. Uh, no books in the Bible were written by him. No books written for him, named after him. None of that. There's nothing uh, in church history where we uh, see him as a pastor or any other ministry uh, recognition outside of what we find in our the book that we're reading uh, in studying the book of Philippians. He's very much the picture of humble Christian service. He's the ordinary man who surrendered to serve an extraordinary God. And because of that, he serves as a great example for all of us. I mean, we, we look at Paul, and, and most of us probably don't connect with Paul on the same level. Paul was well-known. He was an apostle. He was a well-known preacher, teacher, and missionary. Uh, wrote, uh, used, God used him to write much of, of the New Testament. And even Timothy was quite well-known uh, because of his uh, association with Paul. Uh, he pastored some well-known churches. But Epaphroditus, he's the, he's the, the common person, the common, uh, regular, committed, faithful church member of uh, First Baptist Church of Philippi, or whatever the church's uh, name there was, but he was a faithful servant of God. And, and, and so that's what we want to look at uh, this morning, is somebody who was just Christ-like in their service for the Lord, and that's Epaphroditus. Since chapter 1, which um, Adam read with our scripture reading, Paul has been, uh, behave, he's been preaching, teaching the church to live in a way that honors the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says the way to do that is really through humility. Uh, it's through humble service, thinking of others more important than yourselves. And he gives the ultimate example of Jesus uh, in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. And then he exhorts the church to, to, to live that out through the power of the Spirit, to shine as lights. And, and now he's providing some human examples for us to follow. We, we looked at Timothy last time uh, when we were in Philippians, and now we see Epaphroditus. And so in Philippians 2, 25 through 30, <clears throat> we read about this man. And he says, Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my, my brother and companion in labor, and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all, and was full of heaviness, because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick, nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore more carefully, that when you see him again, you may rejoice. And that I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, uh, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation. Because for the work of Christ, 
he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, in order to supply your lack of service toward me. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we, we just thank you for this day that you've given to us, Lord. We thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for the time that we can look into your word. And as we do that, help us uh, to see uh, how incredible the sacrifice uh, uh, this man, Epaphroditus, made. And, and Lord, we pray that you would use it in our lives uh, to motivate us uh, to Christ-like Christian service. And we pray that uh, your spirit would, would work in each of our hearts, that you would speak to us where we need it and, and change us where we need to be changed, that ultimately you would be magnified through it all. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. And we have in Epaphroditus, as I said, a man who exemplifies a Christ-like uh, service, Christian service, which is what we all should be, is, is Christian service. Christian servants, where we're all believers, born into the family of God, and, and we're expected to serve. And this man uh, exudes that. This man is a, a Christ-like Christian servant. And so, what is a, a, a Christ-like servant? Well, number one, he's engaged in service. And that's what we see Epaphroditus is. He's engaged in serving. Uh, he says, yeah, I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion, in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministered to my wants. And so, when we were in Philippians 2 last time, we saw that Paul wanted to send Timothy. He also wanted to go to the church, but uh, he wasn't sure when that was going to happen. But he says it's necessary now to send the Epaphroditus for reasons that we'll get into uh, a little later. Uh, but in verse 25, what we have here is a description, a resume, if you will, uh, to give us an idea of what kind of man this of Epaphroditus was. He was a man who was, who was busy, who was engaged in the ministry. Uh, and he begins by calling him his brother. Paul calls Epaphroditus his brother. Now, the term speaks of friendship. It speaks of partnership. And it speaks of family ties. Uh, to Paul, Epaphroditus was family. Uh, the name of Epaphroditus means favored by Aphrodite, uh, who was a Greek goddess of love, which probably means that Epaphroditus grew up in a pagan household. His parents uh, were probably Greek pagans who, you know, worshipped the Aphrodite and named their son after that. But now, he's no longer a pagan. He has faith in Christ to Paul. Paul, of course, is a Jewish person from birth, and now he's considering a, a Gentile uh, of pagan background, his brother in Christ, and that's what the gospel does. It changes people. It changes relationships. It brings people of all different backgrounds, different nationalities, different cultures, different political uh, affiliations.
persecution. They were facing hardship. And it was a dangerous uh, thing to be a Christian uh, where they were. And so uh, Paphroditus is called a fellow soldier. Uh, he's enduring hardship with me together. The hardships of this life, really that's the only way to endure hardship is together. Uh, which is why God has given us the church. We don't have to go through it. We don't have to deal with the difficulties that are associated with the Christian life or, or difficulties associated with sin or, or persecution. We don't have to deal with those things alone because we have each other. That's the idea. Paul and Epaphroditus had each other. That they could stand side by side as one in order to help each other through the struggles that come from living between uh, the fall in Genesis 3 and then perfection in Revelation chapter 20. Because there are hard times there. And so if you look around you here this morning, you're looking at your fellow soldiers. Those that uh, we should be able to lean on. Those that we should be able to depend on as we deal with the struggles that come with living in a sin-cursed world, living in sinful flesh, to help each other fight the spiritual battle. And Paul and Epaphroditus were that. They shared a common struggle. They were fighting this. They were facing persecution together. Um, and it wasn't a physical fight. They weren't putting up their dukes, so to speak, to, to fight their opponents. Uh, but they, and they weren't fighting the authorities either, or those who persecuted them. They were fighting sin. They were fighting discouragement. They were fighting temptation. They were fighting the devil uh, together in this spiritual battle. And that's, we need to fight together, standing side by side, helping, helping each other with that same uh, struggle, which is one of the reasons why we want to do uh, the monthly Bible studies on Wednesday nights, to help parents fight together. Uh, the battle uh, that takes place in, in parenting, the spiritual battle that's there. And same thing with, with men and, and others. That's what we want to do on, uh, on Wednesday nights, is have a Bible study, see what God says about it, and then the fellowship together, uh, helping each other through those things. That's kind of the idea, uh, because we're in this battle together as a church. And that's one of the, the blessings we have of being part of a church family, is that we are fellow soldiers engaged in this battle. And then he calls him a, a messenger as well. He says, I suppose it's necessary to send uh, Epaphroditus, my brother uh, and companion, my and laborer, my fellow soldier, but your messenger. And that word literally is apostle. Now, Epaphroditus was not an apostle in the official sense, like Paul was, but he was one that was sent out, which is the literal rendering of apostle, messenger, sent out one. Uh, and, and so he was the messenger for the church of Philippi. Right? He was the guy that was sent uh, to take... Uh, this love offering, because in Paul's days, the prisoners were not cared for by the state. They didn't get nice dinners, they didn't get TV, they didn't get a uh, weight room or a library or any of that stuff. They didn't get anything. Their necessities for life, especially food, had to be taken care of by friends or relatives, by people that cared enough for them uh, to provide those things. And so the Philippian church cared for Paul. We know this. We've read this. Uh, and so they took this love offering for him uh, to provide for his needs. Somebody was going to have to get it there. Uh, and so Epaphroditus was the man who represented the church uh, to take uh, this offering to them, to him. And this was a tremendous act of service for Epaphroditus. In those days, he couldn't go down to the bus station. He couldn't go down to the train station. He couldn't hop on a jet uh, and be in Rome in a couple of hours. The trip uh, would take commitment. It would take sacrifice. Uh, one commentator says the trip would cover 729 miles. Uh, most likely would have taken him 57 days, is the thought, with a rest on each Lord's day. So that's a trip of almost two months uh, away from his friends, away from his family, away from the comforts of his own home. That's a commitment. That is a sacrifice. That is an incredible example. And, and this trip wasn't just to take the money there and then head back. It was to stay there and to minister to Paul's needs. And that's what he says next. And he's also a minister to my wants, that is my lacks, at least I'm lacking, it's not, um, uh, I want a slushie, so go get me a slushie, it's, it, it's the things that I need, the things that I have need of, the things that I, I don't have, uh, and so the word minister is a word that means minister as a priest, and so Epaphroditus represented the Philippian church to Paul, he models this selfless, this sacrificial service, this is Christ-like service that we see here. Uh, he was bringing their offering on behalf of the Philippian church, serving God by serving Paul and serving his church. And so he's a minister of Paul's needs, meaning, meaning he probably did whatever the apostle asked him to do. Uh, probably uh, the everyday things that Paul being in prison couldn't take care of. 
maybe running errands, uh, going grocery shopping, uh, getting the things necessary for day-to-day -day living, helping with the, the cooking, uh, going and running down people that maybe Paul wants to talk to, transcribing his letters, uh, most likely sharing the gospel with, with people who came by. Uh, whatever the task was, there was no job too big and no job too small for this man. Because his life was all about serving Jesus Christ, and this was just one way in which he could do that, whatever it was. Um, now, Epaphroditus, he was just seeking to be an encouragement to Paul uh, on behalf of the Philippian church. That was it. Uh, and for the most part, he was this behind-the-scenes kind of guy, doing whatever was necessary to help Paul. Paul was the one that gets the recognition, but uh, that Paul's ministry uh, required this man's help, which is important for us to understand. The Bible doesn't make a distinction between uh, clergy and laymen like you hear out there. We who are part of the family of God are all servants of Jesus Christ. With different gifts, different abilities, uh, but we're all equally important, equally useful to the cause of Christ and to the mission of this church. So regardless of whether or not you ever teach a, a Sunday school class or a, or a BBS class or sing a solo or, or whatever, you are gifted. And you are useful for God's purposes. There is a role for you here. Uh, Paul understood that. Epaphroditus understood that. And so he did his part as a fellow laborer. Uh, he was engaged in the service. Uh, he was a child of God and did everything he could to serve his God. Uh, he, as far as we know, he was the pastor. He may have, some speculate he may have been a, a deacon of the church. Uh, but whatever he was, he had an impact on Paul. He had an impact on his church. And he had an impact for Jesus Christ because he was always willing to do whatever it took uh, to serve because he had offered himself to that service. I read a story of a, a young boy who sat in church and watched as the offering plate went by. And uh, he wanted to make sure that he could give something uh, in the offering. And so he reached in his pockets, but to his dismay, there was nothing in there. So when the plate got near him, he grabbed the plate, he put it on the ground, and he got in. I don't know if this is the true story or not, because the best thing he had that he could offer was himself. I could imagine Alex doing that, so I could see this being a true story. But um, that's what he did. He offered himself. And this is what Epaphroditus did. He was tasked with bringing a financial gift to Paul uh, and then serving him however Paul needed to serve. Can we do this? Can any one of you do this? Absolutely. Any one of us in here can serve the way of Aphrodite. That you can help out with something that needs to be done. It may be something as simple as uh, changing a, a clock. I mean, changing a battery in a clock. Or changing a clock the clock story. Um, taking care of uh, communion cups. It may be helping take down chairs, put chairs back up. Uh, taking care of the books. It could be uh, sitting and, and listening to verses when a lot of club starts. And what a ministry that is, really. Uh, to be able to help children as they learn the scriptures. And you don't even have to be good at uh, public speaking or anything to do that. But it's an important, valuable ministry. You could be used as an encouragement to somebody else with a phone call, with a visit, with a text, or a note, or a card in the email. Epaphroditus served in humility. He didn't need the light to shine on him because he was too concerned with reflecting the light of Jesus Christ. And we can do the same. It said that uh, Ronald Reagan had a, a slogan uh, on his desk at the White House that read, there's no limit to how far a man can go if he doesn't care who gets the credit. Paul was like that. And Epaphroditus was definitely like that. And we must understand that to serve in some unnoticed, unrecognized place in the body of Christ is as much uh, the work of Christ as public ministries. It's just as important. We as believers are called to worship God and serving him. What can you do? to serve him. Is there a need here in this church that you can meet? Does one of your church family members have a need that you can meet? <coughs> Whether unnoticed or unnoticed, Christian service, Christ-like service uh, is needed. And a Christ-like servant is engaged in service. Epaphroditus was engaged in service. And secondly, a Christ-like servant is excessively selfless. And that's what we see from this man in verses 26 through 28. So he says, for he longed after you all, and was full of heaviness, because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick, and I am the death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I said him therefore the more carefully, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. 
And so we understand now uh, why Paul wanted to send this man back. He wanted, he and Timothy were not able to get there, but he, after careful thought, deliberation, decided it was necessary to send the Paphroditus back home to Philippi. And he decided this because of the excessive concern that Epaphroditus had for his home church. And in verse 26, it says he longed after these people. And he was full of heaviness. Long means he's yearning for them. Uh, he's full of heaviness. That doesn't mean he ate too much. He ate out too much on his way uh, from Rome to Philippi. Um, the word means that he was dealing with intense discomfort. Again, not from eating too much. Uh, but it's intense discomfort mentally uh, and spiritually. The same word, heaviness, here is used to describe Jesus as he went to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane prior to facing the Father's wrath. And it says, And he took with him Peter and the sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful. And he was very heavy because he knew what was coming. And now, of course, uh, Epaphroditus is not uh, facing anything compared to what Jesus was about to face, but Epaphroditus agonized. He was concerned for the church. Why? Well, he was concerned because they had heard that he was really sick. Now, how did they hear? Uh, he didn't send out a prayer letter or an email or make a phone call. So how did he know? Well, Epaphroditus made a long journey from uh, Philippi to Rome with a love offering. And so most likely, he didn't go alone because it would be dangerous to go alone carrying money. And so most likely, perhaps, he got sick on his journey. Uh, and one of the men who was with him, or even if it wasn't on the journey, one of the men who was with him might have gone back to Philippi and brought the news. And so Epaphroditus was so sick, it tells us, that he was knocking on death's door. It says, for indeed he was sick, not yet to death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also. Lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. He was on his death. But God had mercy on him and healed him. Notice Paul was not able to heal him. That's another discussion for another time. But uh, Paul could heal people before. Now it seems that those gifts of healing had passed away. But God heals him, and God has mercy on Epaphroditus, and it was also mercy on Paul, because uh, Paul would have been grieved deeply if this man had passed. So he says, sorrow upon sorrow. But praise be to God that this man was healed. Uh, but it seems that throughout this sickness, and especially now that he's better, he's more concerned with the Philippian church. How are they going to handle the news that I'm sick? Uh, I wonder what they're thinking. Oh, they, must be, they must be a wreck. Uh, they don't know that I'm feeling better now. What, what can I do? And so Epaphroditus understands that they're going to be concerned with him. And so he's excessively concerned about them. Shockingly, it's not about his own health. It's not about his own well-being. But he's concerned about this church. He isn't pitying himself. He isn't looking for sympathy. He isn't asking others to bend over backwards for him. He's not calling up his mom uh, for some chicken soup. He's, oh, how are they going to handle this? How is the church at Philippi going to deal with this? He was worried about them. He was concerned about them. More so than his own well-being. More so than his own life. This is Philippians 2, 3 and 4 lived out. Which says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. And that's what he's doing here. Look not every man on his own things. Like your own sickness to death. But every man also on the things of others. They're worrying about my sickness. And that's what Epaphroditus is. He is exemplifying this excessive selflessness that a Christ-like servant has. This goes against the grain of everything that our culture teaches today. Look out for number one. you got to take care of yourself. You have to do what is right for you, what is best for you. And that's, that was the philosophy of Paul's day, too, which is why he's writing to the church at Philippi to, uh, to live in the way opposite of that. Remember, he said that everybody is seeking their own things, not the things of Christ. It was common to be selfish and to look out for number one. Well, Epaphroditus breaks that mold. Uh, he, he's regarding the church as more important than himself here. He's not looking to his own interests or his own illness, but to the well-being of his church family. And so because of that care, because of that concern, uh, Paul says, I need to send it back to you. Because he cares that much. And he says in verse 28, I sent him therefore more carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice. And that I may be the last sorrow. And so he sends it back with the letter that we're reading today. The letter to the Philippians. Not because of Epaphroditus was homesick. Not because he couldn't handle the ministry. Not because he was tired of helping Paul. He was done. But he was sent back because he was just excessively selfless. He was so concerned. Uh, so worried about his church family. 
more worried about that, more concerned about that than the fact that he almost died. And this is an incredible, uh, again, testimony of what the gospel does. The church of Philippi is made up of, of mostly Gentiles who lived in a self-centered uh, pagan culture. Uh, to know that they would be worried and concerned, concerned about one of its members is all because of the life-changing power of the gospel. It changes us. Uh, Epaphroditus, again, like I said, probably grew up in a pagan, unbelieving household, but he has changed, uh, and now he is not so uh, much selfish that he's concerned about his own needs, but he's worried about his church family. That's the gospel. That's what it works in every believer, as the Spirit does its work in us. Uh, and, and that's, that's church life. When one of us suffers, we all suffer. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. That's, that's church family life right there. And we see it so clearly in Epaphroditus. Uh, I'm, I'm sick. They know I'm sick. They're worried about me. I'm worried about them. Paul's worried about the whole group. That's love. That's, that's excessive selflessness that, that, that comes to the power of the Spirit, to the power of the Gospel. That's the default position for the church, that we work as a body, we have different roles, we have different functions, as I mentioned, but we're all united in Jesus Christ. And because of that, we're selflessly concerned and caring for one another. So that if one person is sick, if one person's hurting, if one person's discouraged, we all feel it. And that's what's happening here. There's mutual empathy. There's extreme selflessness. The Christ-like servant is a person of excessive selflessness. He's somebody who thinks more of others than he thinks of himself. One writer said, uh, a man who thinks much of himself saves others the trouble of thinking about him. It's interesting. But the lowly, the humble, the modest, the unpretending, the retiring, the self-emptied, who think of and live for others, who walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, these are the people to be thought of and cared for, loved, and honored as they ever will be by God and his people. And that's the Christ-like servant. That's, that's a Epaphroditus. The Christ-like servant is engaged in service, and they're excessively selfless, and they're extremely sacrificial, verses 29 and 30. And so Paul says, Receive him therefore the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. So Paul says, yeah, I'm sending him back because he longs for you. I, I want to reassure you. He's excessively concerned about you. So when he gets back, he didn't fail. He's not, I'm not sending him back because he has somehow failed me. He has somehow uh, not lived up to the ministry that you've called him to because probably the expectation was he was going to remain with Paul until Paul uh, was released from prison or if he was killed in prison. Uh, either way, then he would go back. Uh, but because of his sickness, because of his extreme concern for the church, Paul has decided in the end it's probably going to be better to send him back. And so he says, hold this person in high regard. Receive him with joy and gladness because he did not fail. He was a successful servant because he gave it all. He gave his life. He was extremely sacrificial. So he says, welcome him back with honor because it was for the work of Christ that he almost died. It was for the ministry that almost Killed. He was not concerned about his own life. He was concerned about me, Paul said. He was concerned about the cause of Christ ultimately. And so, as I said, Epaphroditus left his home. He made this long journey uh, of Rome where he, would have, where he was exposed somewhere to a deadly disease, either on his journey or after he got there. He was away from his family, away from his friends, away from his church. And so why, why do this, right? This seems foolish from a human perspective. But he did it. He does it for Jesus Christ. He does it for the glory of God. And from a human perspective, yeah, it probably is. But for a God who gave up everything for you, who gave up his life for you, there's no sacrifice to bring. This is an extreme an example of extreme sacrificial service for Jesus Christ. Some speculate that he may have gotten pneumonia as he traveled to Rome. Uh, others think that he contracted the Roman plague. Uh, ancient church tradition says that Epaphroditus was well known for his work among the sick in Rome. And so he would go and help those people who were sick and probably contracted the disease helping others. We don't know for sure, but whatever it was, it seems like it was the ministry that got him in this position. 
Uh, I found this fake ad online. How would you respond to it? Wanted, understudy for well-traveled but trouble-prone missionary. Must be able to suffer illness and hardship without complaining, to travel to distant countries and be separated from your loved ones for long periods of time, to teach and be taught, to evangelize, organize, and be flexible when nothing goes right. Must put up with low pay, long hours, high stress levels, and intense opposition. Often attacked, occasionally stoned, beaten weekly, frequently arrested. Interested applicants should contact the Apostle Paul. Know anybody who would be willing to do that? Well, we have somebody here. Epaphroditus was willing to do that, and he did those things. He was willing to put the cause of Christ ahead of his own comfort, ahead of his own, his own life. In fact, it says that uh, he put it all on the line for Jesus Christ. Nothing was more important in his, in his life than doing the will of his God, even if it cost him everything. It says that he didn't regard his life. That word literally means he gambled his life. Uh, it means to throw aside or to throw down. It was used, the word was used in a game that they would play in Greece where, called throwing the stake, where they put their hand down on a surface, a surface and they would throw a wooden pointed stake up in the air or drop it down, hoping that they didn't hit their hand. Maybe you played that game with a pencil when you were a kid. I don't know, on your desk at school. No, just me. Uh, okay. Uh, but that was the idea. Uh, it was also used to describe gamblers who threw their money down and exposed them to the danger of loss. And so some have called the Packer that is the Christian gambler, not in the way we think of gambling, but he was willing to throw aside his life. Why? For the cause of Jesus Christ. He was voluntarily willing to sacrifice his own welfare, his own comfort, for Jesus Christ. He was willing to do anything, go anywhere for Jesus Christ. The missionary Jim Elliott, who gave his life for Christ, trying to reach the Aka Indians of South America, said he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to be his life, to gain what he cannot lose. And Epaphroditus lived according to that law. He put everything that he had on the line for Jesus Christ. And in, in fact, in the third century, uh, there are groups of Christians known as the gamblers, which comes from this work, word, who are known for their work among the diseased and the dead. They would help those suffering with the plague uh, because nobody else would go near them. Uh, and so they would come in and take care of the sick, and then they would bury the dead bodies because you know, everybody else in that culture was like, I don't want to get this. But these men and women known as the gamblers are willing to sacrifice for the cause of Jesus Christ. They are willing to put their lives on the line because of this man, because of what Epaphroditus did, who put his life on the line for Jesus Christ. He was willing to cast it all aside for the sake of the gospel. Are we willing to do the same thing? Serving Jesus Christ, serving others, being involved with ministry and people, is a risk. there's a risk involved. There's always a risk when you put yourself out there. A risk of ridicule, uh, rejection, uh, whatever, it may, criticism, uh, anything else, you name it. There's a risk involved in the ministry. Because serving Jesus Christ, it will cost you, but it is worth it. To serve Christ, to serve others, means that we're putting their needs ahead of our own. And it may mean that we have to change our plans every now and then. It may mean, and it definitely means we will have to sacrifice. Uh, I read a story of, uh, uh, from John MacArthur that uh, when he first was called to Grace Community Church, uh, uh, he, he was just all about being faithful, and, and God was starting to build that church. And, and he said in those early years of that ministry, everybody was sacrificing. And he mentioned one couple who actually sacrificed their honeymoon uh, in order to give to the church. Pretty high sacrifice when, when, when you just get married, but Christianity involves sacrifice. Uh, F.B. Meyer, who was a pastor who preached into his 80s, uh, when he was at the age of 82, he said in one of his sermons, I have only one ambition, and that is to be God's errand boy. That's it. One thing, I just want to do what God wants me to do, wherever it is, whenever it is, anytime, no matter the cost. Are we at God's disposal? Are we willing to do whatever God wants us to do? Are we willing to sacrifice to help others, to encourage others? When was the last time that we took ourselves out of our comfort zone for the sake of the gospel, to share it with somebody else? Well, we have an opportunity this Saturday to do that. Now, if you're going to be around, I would encourage you to be willing to make that sacrifice. Be willing to 
maybe have a few awkward conversations. <coughs> But one writer said it's the curse of Western Christianity that we've constructed a Christian culture that effectively keeps us from taking risks anymore for the sake of the gospel. And he says, what is keeping us from this type of sacrifice? Maybe it's fear. Fear of men. Fear of looking foolish. Fear of not knowing how to answer. Fear of losing something. But one writer said, when you fear God, you fear nothing else. But if you don't fear God, you fear everything. So maybe that's our problem. But the bottom line here is that God is looking for people who are willing to sacrifice, people who are willing to take risks for Jesus Christ, people who are willing to leave the comfort of their own home to go across the street, people who are willing to leave the comfort of their own community to go across the sea. God is looking for those type of people, people who are willing to leave our selfish pursuits for the for somebody else, to selflessly serve someone else, because that's what Epaphroditus did. You know what this world needs? You know what our, our church needs? What we all need is people who commit themselves to be like this man. We need men, women, boys, and girls who put it all on the line for Jesus Christ, who hold nothing back, who are th- people who are, oh, who are engaged in, in service, who are, are thinking of others as more important than themselves, and who are willing to do anything for Jesus Christ. Give us that, and God will use us to bring his glory to this world. And are we willing to sacrifice our time, our resources, our energy, to be here on Sundays, to be here on Sunday evenings, to pray together for, for, for God's purposes to be done in this world, to, for him to help us accomplish those purposes? Are we willing to sacrifice, as I mentioned, some time this coming Saturday to help share the love of Christ, to help out with BBS, to help out with Awana or Children's Church or Sunday School, or, or to make a difference in our own communities, or even just to make a difference in the lives of one of our church family members? Are we willing to selflessly meet needs that we see? That's what Epaphroditus did. He wanted to meet others. Paul had a need of financial help, uh, an encouragement in the prison. Uh, the Philippian church had a need of someone to bring that offering, and the man was the Epaphroditus who did, to meet those needs. Then he got sick, um, and he was eager to meet the need to reassure his home church that he was okay. This man exemplifies Christ-like service. He's engaged in serving, he's excessively selfless, and he's extremely sacrificial. So much so that he was willing to risk his own life, sacrifice his own life. And again, the question is, why would anyone do this? Why would anyone be willing to sacrifice anything like this? And the only answer is because of what Jesus Christ did for us. What was our greatest need? We needed somebody to save us from our sin. Because every one of us has rebelled. Every one of us has disobeyed God. We may not see that what we've done as, as that big of a deal, but it's a big deal to God. When we sin, we tell God, I don't like your authority. I don't like your rules. In fact, I don't like you. And, and I would do a much better job at being God than you are. And so I'm going to be my own God. Now, we don't say that with our lips, usually. Uh, but that's what sin is saying, no matter what that sin is. And it's against God. And it's against his standard of perfection. And, and so because we've sought to be our own God, we've sought to overthrow God's uh, rightful rule, God must punish that. And God will punish because he is just. Uh, and so, because of our sins, we're locked into an eternity of everlasting punishment with no way of escape. And so our greatest need is to be rescued from that. So God in Jesus Christ steps in. He comes in taking on perfect humanity in order to die on the cross and face the punishment that our sins deserve, that we should have faced. He dies as our substitute. He died for you and me, rose again, victorious over sin, victorious over death, that if you would come to a place where you realize that you're a sinner and and you need forgiveness and that you would cry out, you would ask God believing, please save me, forgive me. I've sinned against you. He will. And so that's why we that's why we commit our lives to Jesus Christ because he has done so much for me. He has given his life for me. And again, I mentioned the song that we sang before the message started, I gave my life to my precious blood I shed, that thou might ransom be and raised up from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou 
given for me. I gave, I gave my life to thee. What hast thou given for me? And I'll stop there. But that's the question. Because of what Christ has given us, what are we willing to do for him? Epaphroditus was willing to risk his life. He was willing to sacrifice it all for Jesus Christ. Are we willing to do the same? What's right? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We thank you for his willingness to go to the cross and die in our place. And we thank you for this example that we have in Epaphroditus, who's willing to give his life to serving you because of what you've done for him. Help us to follow in his footsteps. Help us, through the power of your spirit, to give our lives to serving you because of the great sacrifice that you have given to us. Lord, we can't do it without you. Help us uh, and use us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.